Well, thanks very much. I wasn't sure whether you'd be glad to see me again. I've been gone for four years. Uh, when I left California, actually, uh, that was 1997. I was here working with Alice Furry, 1996 and 97. And in that short year, I learned more about reading politics than I ever had any idea of. But uh, and it was an exciting year, I thought a tough year, but when I went to work in Washington, where I've been for the last four years, I really felt that I'd gone from the frying pan into the fire. And now that I'm out of D.C. and I'm back here, it's like going from the frying pan into the state of enlightenment. <laughs> it's really great. I am, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. Um, I wish I knew everything there was to tell you about solving all these problems of teacher preparation because I am always learning myself as we go um, and I only have an hour with you. I'm going to share some insights that I've gained from my work in Washington and from my work with teachers over the last four or five years and from my colleagues who are valiantly working out in the field, not only in institutions of higher learning, but also in large urban districts in particular where the need for change is obvious. Oh, okay. So in this session, I'm gonna talk about some specific concepts and practices in reading instruction that teachers deserve to know that we have so far withheld from them on a fairly large scale. And secondly, I'm gonna emphasize the evidence that should shape the content the process and the context of professional development for teachers of reading. You have in your handout packet a work in progress. My latest version of a blueprint, the idea of the blueprint came from the first work Alice and I did together in 1996 and 97. This is the updated, elaborated um, work in progress that I believe will be part of the uh, Reading First initiative leadership academies that Ed and I and some other people are working on that will be uh, up and running in January. I'm not going to show you that same information on the slides, but I'm going to try and elaborate a few lessons I've learned from working with teachers and what I think they, they mean for the way we do teacher preparation. First of all, effective work with teachers, in my opinion, is continuously grounded in theoretical frameworks that are represented in an elegant but understandable way that are consistent with research and that we can represent, say, in a poster behind our desks that we can whip out or the inside cover of a book. And those would have to do with how children learn to read, what skills and proficiencies facilitate good reading, how do good readers differ from poor readers, what practices have been proven to work with specific kinds of kids. In my work with teachers, even though I may focus intensively on some part of learning to read, I always come back to these basic questions and summarize what there is to know in terms of these basic findings of science. In the area of phonology, um, we still have some of our thorniest problems to solve. Uh, for one thing, we have represented to teachers and to the world out there that phoneme awareness is basically a set of activities that we can now throw into the kindergarten curriculum and expect to get some results. What we need to do instead is cultivate or teach teachers an understanding that phoneme awareness is one aspect of phonological processing that has been shown to have a very strong predictive relationship with reading outcomes. However, there are many other dimensions of phonological processing that bear on the ability to learn vocabulary words, the ability to remember information that's given verbally in the classroom, the ability to differentiate verbal concepts that sound alike but, th but that are very different in meaning, and the ability to retrieve information to be uh, proficient at verbal communication. 
I wrote a little article, again, uh, under the leadership of Liz McPike. I um, mean, she's uh, so sorry she's not here today, but in the last American Educator that she did in the summer, she had me write a little story, basically, about my work in D.C. And in that uh, article, it's called Overcoming the Language Gap, I told this story of a child I saw in a fourth grade classroom in D.C. Who was, going, who was working with one of our finest teachers. The end result with this class is always outstanding. The teacher is a model. I often took the camera in there to observe her at work. And in the fourth grade lesson, the, the word shock was on the vocabulary list. And the teacher realized that the word shock was being used in a, with a kind of secondary meaning in the text. So she asked the children in her very um, embedded contextual way, which was called for in that inc incident, she asked the children what the word shock meant and elicited several meanings. And then there was this little girl over in the corner who raised her hand and said, I know, Miss Woods, it's that big fish that swims around in the ocean that might bite you when you go swimming. And this child had gone to the fourth grade without realizing the word shark and the word shock were different words. So this teacher, having been in my clutches for three years, <laughs> picked up the cue and very beautifully said, no dear, that word is different. And she wrote it down, she contrasted the phonemes that are different and explained to the child that she could readily have confused those, but she needed to pronounce these words distinctively and associate the right meaning with the word. So um, our, e even some of our finest leaders have difficulty with phonological production. It's legendary, right? It has nothing to do with intellectual ability. It has nothing to do with leadership capacity. It's simply a, 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 an aspect of language processing that people need to have in order to uh, be verbally proficient, and that has a lot to do with basic skills in reading, vocabulary, and spelling. Um, Secondly, we want to get across the function of this in the overall reading process and get teachers away from the idea that they can do a smattering of activities and still get the job done. We don't want teachers to be activity oriented as much as focused on the intention of getting the kids to build their own uh, differentiated ideas of what is, uh, of what are, what the sounds are in words. That's the goal of this. And there is a developmental progression that if we follow it, we're more likely to lead children into that insight and it doesn't go away in kindergarten or first grade for those children who are having verbal difficulties. And the third thing that I see rampant confusion about is that phonology and phonics are different. And it is, uh, if you want to select a textbook for your courses, um, the first thing to look for is whether or not the authors differentiate phonological processing from phonics. And uh, I mean, nine out of ten textbooks I pick up that are supposed to teach teachers about reading do not make this distinction. It's very confusing for teachers. And of course, what we need to do is have a little section that says these are the speech sounds and these are the way we rep represent them. And then the next chapter, this is the system by which we represent these speech sounds. These two things are different. They need to be related to one another. But we need to get a handle on each one. What I tell my students, what I make my students do, even these hapless teachers in DC, is I'd say you need to get a divorce between your phonological processor and your orthographic processor if you can get them divorced, then you can get them back together again and to do explicit, systematic teaching. So look for that divorce in the textbooks. <laughs> okay, so now uh, I think a lot about this. Why is this hard? Why is it hard for people to get this? And we, c we should never lose sight of why it's difficult. I have totally changed my tune about this. I used to march around sort of thinking, you know, everybody in the world is a lesser being because they can't quite figure out how many speech sounds there are in a word. Well, since then I've been really, I know I have been truly humbled by the, um, uh, even in very motivated people, how much practice they need to get this basic insight. We're talking about a basic insight that we're not wired to be uh, conscious of. It is a developed artificial, a natural insight that's particularly important for reading. It's not so important for many other things. So the problem, of course, is that the word ice 
has I, but it has three letters in it. The word psi has s, I, but it has four letters in it. And if you look at these two words, they don't look anything alike, even though they have the same two speech sounds in a different order. You know, that, you know, with this simple example, we can get at the essence of the problem in learning to read and learning to understand what the learner is up against if we are a teacher. And so our problem is, how do we cultivate insights as well as specific word recognition abilities that lead to fluency and comprehension? I think this is an enormously interesting problem because um, we're at the stage still of just barely recognizing that this is an issue we must become much more scientific about in studying how to give people the insight so that they can get on with the business of teaching higher level language skills. I always start every class with what is a vowel and what is a consonant. But the disservice we do in, in these textbooks that need revision and even the instructional programs is we never bother to tell teachers what all the vowels are and what all the consonants are. And I mean the sounds, not the letters. Uh, and it's, this is simple, but it's basic. And we need to begin with this. A vowel is e a a a a i a a a o o u o i a l a r o r r, and that's. Just a little practice. You can do it. And of course, if you have that many vowels and you have only five letters, you have the biggest dilemma in in alphabetic orthography. So um, we, need, we need to show the system. If we're talking about systematic teaching, we need to begin with the system. And it's very straightforward, but you almost never find it in a textbook. So let's, you know, let's, uh, if we don't have a textbook, make up a, a better textbook. I need to write another textbook. I haven't done this yet in a way that's understandable. It's too esoteric in that stuff that's out on the table. But, but, you know, you just make it, the system means you lay out the whole thing, just like the multiplication chart. Here's the whole thing. Now we're going to figure out how we're going to learn this in some logical order, and it's very doable. Um, uh, okay, now, the other insight is that some of these sounds are more confusable than others. And because some sounds are more confusable than others, we have to teach teachers to anticipate the difficulties students will have. So that when they go about teaching the lesson, they'll have some idea of what's going to take more time than something else, unless it's all scripted out for them. But even if it's scripted out, there's still an element of judgment about pacing, repetition, response to error, choice of examples, the incidental opportunities to reinforce things when, when they come up. Um, so uh, we must get across these basic concepts before we even ask the teachers to learn an instructional repertoire. I think Marion and I have a lot of dialogue about this because the other point of view is teach the teachers to do something and then teach them why they're doing it and what the system is all about. We're probably both right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Now, uh, another subtlety, and this perhaps will differentiate the expert teacher from the novice teacher. And this is my next task, to try and propose what differentiates an expert teacher from a novice teacher with this basic reading stuff. The fact is, ab uh, phonemes are abstract. Etch, egg, and elect do not all start with the same speech sound. It, igloo, ink, and definition, the second sound and definition, are not all the same. They are, there are subtle differences. So if we want people to learn about phonemes, we have to acknowledge that the choice of examples is important. We should not be giving kids the word egg for eh when the sound in egg is very close to an a. These are subtle things. If you have a great instructional program, someone would have figured this out already, but a lot of the materials people are using are misleading and choose poor examples. I once, in, the, in DC, this one took the cake. The teacher had, poor teacher, I mean, she was a victim of the total lack of leadership in DC at the time, but she had two alphabets on her wall. And one of them had the letter E and the word I, E-Y-E, -E, as an example of that letter. 
And I went in there, and it had been up there for years, you know, it was sort of yellowed around the edges. And I pointed to this, and I said, uh, do you see anything the matter with this? And she had never thought about it. Enough horror stories. Anyway, okay. So the, you know, the examples matter. The insight into what a, a speech sound is matters. The fact that the sound d in desk, dress, fodder, educate, and stand, those are all represented with a D, but the sounds that come out of our mouth are different. This is important because uh, the, for the expert teacher or the reading remediation teacher, you have to know what you're asking kids to do. If you're saying, well, I want you to uh, spell educate, well, the sound in educate is a J, and it's helpful to know why. Okay. Um, why does this elude us? Why is all this difficult? Well, again, the segmentation and blending of sounds in a co-articulated uh, co word is, is an unnatural act, we say. Um, sounds change according to where they're put. There is a hierarchy of learning in phonology that we often don't respect with students. We need to learn that and follow it. We can't just do a smattering of activities and expect to get results. And the, a sophisticated way of saying that we're confused by what we know about spelling is to say that orthography obscures phonology. Linnea Airy has done outstanding experiments on that. Um, and uh, let me show you some examples of how this works. In DC, I had a captive audience. Um, uh, you can imagine um, they weren't so happy to see me in the beginning, but uh, I'll save that story for later. But we did manage to give surveys to the teachers to find out what they really knew about the content they were teaching. I think we are now, in, in the research community, at the point where we're beginning to define really what should go on in the head of a teacher who is able to get results with kids in a much more definitive way. We're able now to really ask, what does the teacher have to know? What is the threshold of knowledge that will get results? What's the threshold of knowledge that will get us results with difficult to teach children? So I give them surveys and ask specific questions. Um, and I find that many teachers are trying to function without the prerequisite phonological skills that are needed to get results. This is not their fault, mainly they haven't been taught, but they need this information to be able to select examples, uh, to recognize errors, and to teach with intention and flexibility so they're not just glued to the teacher's manual, even if it's a great teacher's manual. So on some of the tasks, that we gave, there are two batches of surveys represented here. I'm in the process of writing this up, so this is, this is pre-publication data, but for the K to second grade teachers, we had 50 of those, and I asked them, you know, do, uh, I wanna know, do they know what a syllable is? On the one hand, it's in the standards that you're gonna teach kids syllable awareness, and uh, the third grade teachers are to teach kids syllabication, but I wanna know, do, do the teachers know what a syllable is? because um, that's pretty important. So uh, this shows how many teachers were accurate in counting the number of syllables with these three words, walked, spoil, and shirt. Walked, less than 50%, about 40% knew that walked has one syllable in it. More teachers thought there were two syllables in walked than knew there were one syllable there is one syllable in walked. Uh, with the word spoil, two-thirds of the teachers knew there was one syllable, but fully a third thought there were two syllables in spoil. And with shirt, a fifth thought there were two syllables in the word. Uh, this is alarming, but what it speaks to is the fact that no one has stopped with these teachers and asked them to think hard about what a syllable is. And, and in fact, I confess, ladies and gentlemen, I myself was a reading teacher for about 10 years and until I took a linguistics class in my doctoral program, I myself was not crystal clear about what a syllable was. And I might well have answered that walked had 
two syllables until I thought about it as a spoken linguistic unit organized around a vowel. That is a very helpful concept. It takes about five minutes to teach, and it's very helpful. Phoneme counting. On the one hand, we want teachers to segment and blend sounds. We saw this compelling data about how important it is to do that with young children, how you can get results if you do it 20 minutes a day for um, 15 to 20 weeks, uh, how much of a difference it makes in long-term outcomes. Can the teachers count phonemes? Um, the word sawed has three phonemes in it. I'm going to give you the answers because it's after lunch. But sod has sawed three. Two-thirds of the teachers knew that. But with a third that got it wrong, my interest now is why are they getting it wrong? What do they think is in that word? So in that case, they're overcounting the number of phonemes. And I think because, as Linnea Airy has also demonstrated, they are confused by orthography. They are confused by their knowledge of spelling because a literate person has amalgamated uh, those three modules, the meaning emphasis, the phonological emphasis, the orthographic emphasis, and those are glommed together. That cat thing you did is, was great. So when, you're, when your word image is, is amalgamated, um, actually the orthographic image takes precedence. So it's not that the teachers are linguistically impaired. It's that they are the victims of their own literacy. And this is the essence of the discipline we have to teach. This is a formal instructional process to learn the content of the discipline. It's not an exercise in, in, in uh, you know, teacher abuse, and sometimes people accuse me of that. In fact, I've never had a teacher um, uh, be angry at me for teaching them about the difference between sounds and symbols. The word no, this is fascinating. A fully a third could not count the two speech sounds in no because they're confused by the way I wrote the word. If I'd written it N-O, I would have gotten almost 100%, you know, two sounds, a few people who would have said there was one. Shrimp, however, now this is why it's not so straightforward. The word shrimp, um, less than 60% knew that there is a sh, er, e, m, and p, that's five sounds. Why is that? They're, they're undercounting the speech sounds when the syllable is complex. This is why knowledge of language is important, because it's the amalgamation of these blends that, that's going on. People count a blend as a single unit. They push those blends together. And that would be all well and good, except for the fact that we've documented in studies that one of the most common types of word recognition errors and spelling errors in children who are learning to read is, is leaving out blends and confusing blends. So it would be a logical requirement that teachers would be aware that a blend is not a single speech sound, but two or three in some instances that must be uh, must form the basis of a, of a, of a unitized print-to-speech correspondence uh, uh, mechanism. It must be accurate and differentiated before it can be unitized and automatized. I hope I'm making sense, but I love my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> Phony matching. Even at the first grade level, kids had to do these sound matching tasks where they'd read a word and then find another word in a multiple choice task that had the same sound. The kids didn't do very well on that. And then I began to think, well, can the teachers do it? So, um, so I found 70% could match the uh and push with the uh and sugar. In that case, the same letters used, so that's a giveaway. But when you get to ring, the ng and ring and the ng and sink, we get down to closer to 50% who can find a match there. When you get to the final zzz on was, matching the final zzz on knows, we're down to about 50% uh, and um, under multiple choice conditions. When you get to the t in intend, matching the t in baked, we're down to less than 50% accuracy in a multiple choice matching task. This is the second and third grade teachers on matching the sounds of inflections at the ends of words. What matches the z in dogs? Is it miss, 
has, dex, or niece. Now, uh, my critics always say, well, that's too picky, and that's too mechanical, and that's too unnecessary. But the fact is that, again, errors on these inflections account for misreadings and misspellings at a higher level than almost any other linguistic phenomenon other than blends. We've documented this in this kind of picky research we do, and Rebecca Treeman and, and I and some others have been obsessed by spelling errors all our lives. And out of this, though, we get a rationale for what we need the teachers to know. If this is uh, an essential linguistic problem for students, especially dialect speakers who may not articulate the endings. How will they learn how to write them and get command of the standard cash English they have to learn unless the teacher can make it explicit about 50 times a day? That's the way they're going to get it, not just because it's written into one lesson. So teacher knowledge is absolutely essential. And then this, at the specialist level, the reading specialist, there has to be knowledge of things like how to come up with a minimal pair of words that contrast. And I would think anyone working with students who speak another language would have to do this. What about this z contrast for uh, Spanish speakers? What about um, ch and j? These, these are not easy for kids to get. So you have to come up with lots of examples of words that differ only in that sound to cultivate the student's awareness of the differences in these sounds that are very much alike. Um, now, there, the uh, issue of phonology is just fascinating and, and um, compelling to me, but there's a lot more to reading, right? So beyond basic phonics, and I'm the first one to say we've done a terrible job of teaching phonics on the whole, and still when I look at the textbooks we use and that we give to uh, teachers in training and after training, I see things like laundry lists of rules. That's not the way anybody learns this. Um, and what helps is, again, to be given the system and to have the system ma make sense uh, one basic underlying idea is that our orthography is the result of centuries of language amalgamation and layering. If we use that as a framework, we have some coherency and some order in the whole thing. There's a reason why almost every word is spelled the way it is. Um, so uh, though these are basic frameworks again, the layers of language. Orthography is organized around phoneme-grapheme relationships, but that's not all. Where the older kids fall apart is with syllables and morphemes. Second and third graders, fourth graders. There's the Anglo-Saxon layer, the Latin layer, and the Greek layer. You have eight grades worth of uh, word study here in this simple chart. Um, the one thing that the uh, report on becoming a nation of readers was wrong about was that this word study stuff should be over in second grade. I couldn't disagree more. But this stuff is fun. Kids get into it. You know, the old, old English layer has all our common words, earth, water, light, sun, moon, good. Most of our single syllable words, words that have vowel pairs in them are typically Anglo-Saxon, words for the commonest things that human beings have always shared in their daily lives. And then the first layer over that was Norman French, and we, of course we got words for food, and words for social concepts, and words for um, social class and, um, and, and royalty. And then from Latin in the Renaissance, we got all of these words that are direct Latin borrowings that have a different syllable structure, a different spelling, and a different morphological structure. And then, uh, of course, later in the Renaissance and on to the current day, we have the Greek layer of language, which is our word study in math and science primarily. So we can recapitulate language history and this is great, you know, you think of all the different ways we have to express an idea. <laughs> and, and this one, 
Um, talk, speak, yell, that's Old English. Gossip, of course, is French. And then we have these oh, hoity-toity Latin words, verbalize, articulate, be garrulous, loquacious. You would use, these are the words we use to write. This is formal academic English. And then when we go off it to be uh, scientists and doctors, we talk about uh, prosody and dysphagia and aphasia and paraphasia, um, all that stuff. Okay, that's Greek. <laughs> um, and, and we can improve the way we teach this and make it fun and interesting if, first of all, we get away from teaching letters. One thing I just can't stand is how we tell kids that letters have sounds. That's backwards. We invented ways of spelling sounds. We had sounds way before we had writing. So we start with the sounds. We should start with the sounds and show the way they are spelled. And the fact is that the way they're spelled often uses letter combinations we call graphemes. I know it's a new word, but most people can handle it. And in fact, it takes away all the confusion that comes with the fact that there are 26 alphabet letters that do not do the job. They just don't. But graphemes do. So then you say with the word eight, two sounds. The first sound is A. There are eight or nine ways to spell A in the English language. One of them is E-I-G-H. There's a limited set of maybe eight words you need to know that use E-I-G-H to spell A. Um, it's very straightforward and logical in this way. So I've coined a new term, spellography, to mean the territory of the orthographic system that we should be teaching in phonics and spelling and word study. Uh, another task I gave our teachers was, do you know the difference between a regular word and an irregular word? Boy, was this enlightening. Because their programs are all full of the, word, of the high frequency notion. And if they don't know the difference between a high frequency word and an irregular word, and a regular word. So they think that if the word's high frequency, it can't be regular. So I asked, you know, which of the following are irregular high frequency words? And uh, all of the following are irregular high frequency words, except the answer is when. But what astonished me was only 45% answered that correctly. They didn't know. and. And it's because they don't know that they can't pick up a text and decide whether it's decodable or not. Syllabication, um, even our best programs are not doing the best job with this. This is a fundamental organizational principle in orthography, which I don't have time to teach you today, but should be, especially in the second and third grade, the emphasis of um, the decoding process of multisyllabic words. It's very orderly, it's very um, graspable, it's fun to play with. But I asked the teachers, you know, do you know about this? Question, the second M is moment is not doubled because the first vowel is short, the first vowel is long, the second vowel is a schwa, the first vowel is stressed. Well, fit, even under multiple choice conditions, I only had 50% of my teachers who could answer this. This is second and third grade teachers charged with the responsibility of teaching syllabication to kids using major programs by respectable publishers. This is an unknown concept. And uh, I remember Gretchen Lowey, I think, saying last year a presentation that it is at this level of more sophisticated ideas about orthography that our teachers are not getting the instruction they need. Uh, same thing there, 32% correct on, on this, on what's the structure of cradle, consonant L-E at the end. So there are ideas like syllable complexity that are important. Um, I don't have time to go into that different kinds of morphemes that we need to teach as interesting linguistic elements that serve a certain layer in the language that can be manipulated and changed that have to do with meaning and they don't behave the same. Um, sorry, I don't have three hours with you. Okay, because I want to get to some of the data from DC. Um, fluency and disfluency, one of the uh, I mean, these are ideas about fluency that teachers need. Why would kids be disfluent? 
Well, on the one hand, it's a normal stage of reading development to be disfluent. That's one understanding that has to be there. So they're not grinding away at fluency in first grade, right? Got to be accurate before you can be fluent. It's an intrinsic characteristic of some poor readers who are diagnosed later than first grade. Fluency problems are an enduring characteristic of kids who got off to a late start who were not identified early. And it's also an intrinsic characteristic of a subgroup of kids with reading disorders. And it's also the consequence of not practicing reading. So all those things have an influence. Teachers need to know those possibilities and be able to sort them out and not just do a knee-jerk, oh, fluency is the thing now, we've been neglecting it, let's whip out read naturally and we're all set. And we have to try to avoid simplistic responses to new insights. Um, this has been talked about. Okay, I want to just give you a little more data from the study about the teachers. And the, of course, what I'm saying too is that I, I worked with teachers in DC and did a lot of these things. Uh, we had nine schools in DC over the last four years, eight others in Houston, a five year study. We curtailed it after four years because none of us could continue anymore under the duress, frankly. Um, but it's still going on in Houston. We're working with grades K to four. 96% African-American students, 98% poverty, free and reduced lunch. These schools are in dire straits, high instability, low consistency of anything. Um, seven out of the nine schools I worked with were targeted, threatened with dis, dis, reorganization uh, if they didn't improve. Uh, we followed kids for four years, starting with kindergarten and first grade. We had 800 kids on the DC side, 800 in Houston. It's a massive undertaking. Tested the kids five times a year, uh, uh, once at the end of the year with an achievement battery. So you can see from this too, I had two years with each teacher, grade one, two, and three. I had only one year with the kindergarten teachers, but we kept on working with them anyway. Massive data collection of all kinds, uh, student assessments, different kinds of classroom observations, lots of different teacher surveys. Uh, this is really another presentation, but I'll start with the end and then back up to how we got there. I found out last week that at the end of fourth grade, all of the reading scores on all the Woodcock-Johnson tests uh, in all the schools except two in Houston, unfortunately, betw were between the 50th and 65th percentiles. In other words, um, this says through third grade, but it's also holding through fourth grade. The students are achieving in the average range uh, or better, even at that point where we expect them to be sort of falling off the cliff. I was amazed and pleased to see that. Uh, the code emphasis program has produced stronger results I, I, overall, but especially in spelling and word attack. Uh, but because of the professional development, the program differences were not as marked as they might have been if it, we were just comparing programs. So that was really not the emphasis of the study. The results are basically consistent with the National Reading Panel report. Um, there, we're not finding anything that contradicts what you heard this morning. In Houston, the context for change was completely different. There was district leadership, state leadership. They had Rod Page, Phyllis Hunter, who's the most amazing uh, leader on all of this. Summer academies for all the teachers, each grade level and so on. Uh, accountability and so forth. In DC, we had none of that. None of that. No district initiative, no district leadership. Nothing but confusion about programs. Um, so we just went ahead and did what we could. And so uh, what I'm going to show you about the teacher response has to be viewed in light of this context. We did manage to have a summer institute between two and four days for our teachers. We had in-class visits every month from publisher consultants. We had in-class visits at least once every three weeks by coaches the last year of the study, but not before that. We didn't have the funding. We worked with the administrators. And then I taught courses for the teachers. We bribed them. Cookies, drinks, classroom release time, course credits, 
stipends, anything I could think of, and about half of the teachers took the courses. I did the courses like this, one course in phonology, whole semester. One course in decoding and spelling, whole semester. They hadn't learned it yet, so we did a second semester. Another course in teaching vocabulary and comprehension. I extended that to cover the entire year because the teachers needed so much practice developing their questioning strategies that we needed hours of in-class practice, reading a story, figuring out what the meanings were we wanted the kids to get, and devising questioning strategies that they would then go and implement and then come back and evaluate. We spent an entire term doing that with the help of Rebecca Hamilton, who works with Isabel Beck. We had another course on teaching kids to write, which we um, should have done a number of times more because that was a terrible problem. Conceptual framework for every course, the development of reading and spelling, the components of effective instruction. And when I say the components, all the components that have to be taught well, to me, it's just meaningless to talk about middle ground. Middle of what? You have to teach everything well, period. You know, it's not an issue of balance. It's not a, an issue of little of this, a little of that. It's all of it being taught well. But the question is, how do we get there? So, um, and then the nature of language, language structure, and the rehearsal of validated practices. What do we do? It's what goes on anywhere where this is working, like LA. Modeling, rehearsal, um, uh, al aligning the practices with the materials, the interplay between theory and practice, studying each component in depth. And this is the real bind I think you're in if you're in a faculty of education under constant pressure to do things faster. The fact is it takes time to do each one of these things well enough so that somebody learns them. And I don't know what the shortcuts are. Um, and I think one of the things you have to do is as you uh, sort of go along with the initiative here and support it, you must also be articulate and, and scientific, really, about what it takes to get someone to learn and what the priorities are. You cannot do it all at once. You have to define your priorities, and I think that's really the next discussion that has to go on. Um, in-class uh, support. But the question is this, how do the teachers respond? My critics, you know, our critics are always saying you're too data-based, too much, you know, too many numbers. So we decided to interview all the teachers and do a totally qualitative investigation of the teachers' responses to their work in the project. We sent the former head of the teachers union out to do individual interviews, which she tape recorded, and she uh, guarded the identities of the teachers very carefully. So if they wanted to say, we just can't wait till Moats leaves town and leaves us alone, they could have said that. If they could have said, God, this was a waste of time, I already knew how to do things, you just got me off track, they could have said that, whatever. That didn't happen, fortunately. 49 out of the 50 characterized the experience as positive to extremely positive, spontaneous. This is just, you know, we said, how, you know, what would you say about your experience? You know, really positive. And why? Well, then they, first thing they talked about was student improvement. These teachers want the kids to achieve. <laughs> you know, um, with all it said about teachers, not caring, I found it was just the opposite. We, when they got results, they were absolutely thrilled. Second thing they talked about was insight, insight and understanding. And many of them described how it took about two years to develop insight and understanding. And they said, thank you for making me do certain things because I, I didn't really know why or how. I needed the direction, but it didn't all fall into place until about two years had gone by. Uh, and they characterized empowerment as knowing why they were doing what they were doing and why they were getting results. Um, there was not a single teacher in the sample who mentioned creativity or choice as an unmet need. There was not a single one. Everyone who mentioned this thanked us for giving them fewer choices, more direction, more structure. 
and more clarity because they were sick and tired of conflicting, ambiguous messages that were thrown at them willy-nilly year after year. Material support, actually they didn't care which program they were working with, they were so grateful to have a program even though one of the programs was clearly getting better results than the other, they were equally enthusiastic about their programs. And the other th big lesson was the collaboration. They wanted so much to learn with their peers, and they wanted to overcome the isolation of teaching, and said how much fun that was and what a novel experience it was for them. Um, and the last couple of points here. We have to demonstrate that when we go out and measure teacher knowledge on these very specific linguistic things, that that has something to do with student outcomes. Because my critics often say again, oh, it's not necessary for teachers to know these things. Or you can't burden teachers with these picky things. Or um, uh, we don't have time to teach the teachers that. But uh, at least in two studies now, in ours and in a, an excellent study that's been done at the University of Washington by Deborah McCutcheon, Virginia Berninger, and Ann Cunningham, who's at Berkeley, uh, in their study they got a correlation astonishingly high, I think, given all the variability that accounts for outcomes. Correlation of 0.45 there between kindergarten teachers' ability to answer questions on the MOTES survey that they used and student year-end reading achievement, which is a, just a, a powerful uh, depiction of a relationship of, of between knowledge and student outcomes. In our study, which is what you call the uncontrolled laboratory of public school, we still got a point three correlation between performance on this knowledge survey and student outcomes at the end of the year on Woodcock-Johnson broad reading, which is much higher than I thought it would be because it's hard to get any kind of data that makes sense in, in this kind of um, uh, messy situation, but, it, but we're getting much more than I thought we would get. So my advice is this, um, content counts enormously. Uh, you, we've got to teach teachers these things about language, uh, especially at the pre-service level when they don't have to worry about managing a classroom, at least introduce them to these systems and how they work. And this goes also for what is a sentence? What is a paragraph? How is a text put together? Our teachers did not know the difference, really, between a narrative and expository text. They weren't sure. And they also didn't know how to define what a sentence was. They would say, it's, it's a group of words that has a, a capital at the beginning and a period at the end. That's not a linguistic definition supervised experience, the person who commented on that. I totally agree that uh, we must figure out ways, we must fund this, set it up. Supervised experience, uh, assessing and teaching under the, uh, under, under the mentorship of a competent person. And then we have to practice teaching behaviors, teaching routines, give teachers the feel for these things. Sustain the pre-service into the early years of professional development. There should be a continuum. We should recognize that the very best programs will produce novice teachers who need reinforcement and reteaching of everything you so diligently taught them if your programs are optimal. Let teachers learn one thing at a time. Get away from the smattering of everything and nothing in depth. That serves no one. Uh, coursework and coaching solid theory. Recognize that some of these language concepts are elusive and again they have nothing to do with intellectual ability, they have to do with the nature of the beast. Um, tie the instruction if you can to specific programs at least to inform teachers about what they're going to be working with. I don't think you should teach open court but I think the teacher should know something about sound blending and uh, sentence proofreading and dictation and how you read a story with kids and prepare them ahead and all those things that are in any well-designed program. So preparing to teach teachers to teach reading and language poses unique content-related challenges that have really been underestimated. Good preparation involves time, content-laden coursework, and extended guided practice in a collaborative setting. 
And this is a job we can do, so go for it. <laughs>